Uh, welcome to this uh, really tellingly populated discussion on educating our allies. It's really, really interesting from this perspective. My name is Padisha. I'm a human rights broadcaster and journalist, and I've been doing outreach work with asylum seekers and refugees for about coming up to seven years now, and uh, I've been campaigning since then. Uh, this is a session in which we talk about narratives around refuge, migration, and race. Uh, it may get difficult, but I think that sitting with discomfort is a very good thing. Mm. Uh, so let's try to learn how to do that. Without further ado, we have an amazing panel, so let me just introduce them. Sara Shamsavari is a multidisciplinary artist and academic whose work explores global identity and stereotypes. At the beginning of her life, she was a refugee. She was born in Iran, but she has been here since the age of two. And in our notes that we had beforehand, we talked about the misrepresentations, stereotype, and mistaken assumptions uh, that all of us have encountered, and that would be one of the things that we, we speak about. Bomi Thomas is a jazz musician from Glasgow who was threatened with deportation by the Home Office, saying that she had no right to remain in the UK due to a technicality about a law that was brought into effect when she was nothing more than a baby. That is unrolling as we speak, but she's spoken a lot about that. Gulwali Pasale left Afghanistan in 2006, sought asylum in the UK as a political refugee, and went on to study for his degree and master's here in the UK. He's the co-founder of the My Bright Kite charity, and is also a spokesperson on these issues. Without further ado, let me start, Sara, and the same question will go to everyone about stereotypes and assumptions. In the course of your work and your life and your career, over and above being an activist, have you encountered certain persistent stereotypes, overt or covert, that you found yourself having to push against, shall we say? Both, yeah. Please. Definitely uh, both. I mean, in the beginning of my life, I would say it was more overt. Um, it was more like, go back to your own country. Well, firstly, which one do you think that is? And uh, what if you come from a country where you can't actually go back to? Because there is a difference between economic migrants and refugees. and. Um, you know, if you come from somewhere that where you're persecuted or your family is persecuted, you can't go back to your own country. So, um, you know, just having that experience of having national front stickers put outside our door, you know, being, being me being fairer than my brother, being being told that I was a different race. You know, the ones that persist are you look you don't look like a refugee. You don't look like you've been through that because um, I'm sure you know uh, really in, a really interesting uh, book called The Ungrateful Refugee, which is also by an Iranian, um, talks about how we have to be continually sort of grateful and, um, you know, for our privilege of being here. And I, you know, constantly, um, you know, constantly uh, things like, oh, you, it's really lucky, you're really lucky that you're here and you were able to do that. I mean, sure, that's true, but coming from certain people, it's not, it doesn't feel very nice or it sort of, it, it basically makes you really aware of your otherness or how you're being treated as other, you know, continually being asked, do you speak Arabic, for example, when obviously in Afghanistan and Iran, we speak Farsi, right? the more languages in Afghanistan. Um, so lots of stereotypes, lots of exotification, sexualization. The, the, you know, one of the uh, things that I experience regularly and I've always experienced is this thing where someone comes up to you, oh, are you Spanish or are you Italian? No, I'm from the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, oh. <laughs> And then, you know, this kind of withdrawal of, um, you know, this very weird uh, thing where people are attracted to you, but they also... In fact, I had it when I was uh, eight years old. I remember in the schoolyard, little boy saying to me, um, I like you more than all the other girls, but I can't go out with you because you're foreign. So, and that, that is a sort of a, a running, running theme. So I think it's a very complex... Uh, experience. That's, these are just personal experiences. With my work, there are even more. We'll come back to them in a second. I wanted to bring Bumi in here because you were nodding. You've just enjoyed the many labyrinthine alleyways <laughs> of the Home Office. But, but really, we were talking about sort of 
those daily stereotypes and misassumptions? Well, the daily stereotypes and misassumptions I've experienced are things like, well, oh, wow, your English is really good. Um, and I'm like, oh, why, what do you say to that? Or maybe being at art school where it was expected that because I, I'm, I mean, I was the only black girl at my university, but it was expected that I would create art around primitivism and it was about, um, oh yeah, you should really check out this particular thing. You know, Picasso was inspired by your people. And I thought, yowch. <laughs> Um, other instances, even with the, in, with the experience I had last year with the Home Office not being recognized as Scottish or British, um, even though all my life I've been groomed and educated, conditioned to think of myself and identify in a certain way, and sort of coming to terms with the fact that part of the prejudice is based on the color of my skin, and um, just n even up till this moment, as we're speaking, not being recognized, and then saying, well, actually, we'll offer you discretionary leave, but um, we don't recognize you as Scottish or British, and birthright citizenship is no longer active, and it will not be restored, and we're not accountable to anyone. We're an authority unto ourselves. And deal with it, you know, and being criminalized, I think, first and foremost, it is very, very tangible for people to think that they are British if they're born here if their education, schooling, cultural, psychological kind of experience and education has led towards this conclusion. And so to it being kind of bi being put into a really binary space of other or included, you're lying, you're a criminal, you knew what you were doing, you set out to deceive the state, and it's like, well, actually, no, the state did not disperse information to the public so that they could make informed decisions, so don't criminalize people and call them ignorant even though they have not been informed. But it's also this thing of saying, um, well, you have to be perfect to qualify. I mean, that's a farce. It's a farce, but what is perfection? I mean, I was having this conversation with my sister yesterday about uh, this, uh, I think a Michelin chef, is French, who had a business here for 25 years. And um, I mean, he had an award winning business. This man is like a uh, you know, sorcerer of taste and he's exceptional at what he does. But 25 years doesn't count? I mean, there's a wider conversation around that, but what is exceptional? Or me being told in court, you're not exceptional yeah, enough. We were, we were, we were at her, at <laughs> so was at the hearing, you are not exceptional enough. Shocking. It's, it's, it's all kind of, it's, it's, uh, there are all these pressure points, your economic pressure points, your psychological pressure points, and they hit those buttons because they want to either provoke a reaction or demonstrate their power, but to what end? We're going to come back to this issue, but we have to remember that the name of this panel is Educating Our Allies. So in Sorry. a sense, we have to, this is the, we have a tricky, we have a tricky conversation because we have to speak critically to our friends, sure, not, sure. not to our enemies, at least the home office, as we recognize that they're not good and we don't like them. They're not our friends, we don't like them. Uh, Gulwali, let me come to you. And the original question was really about stereotypes and misassumptions. So the, the, the unconscious, the subconscious stereotypes that you encountered. Thank you, Badesh. I don't know what else I could add, but I think, you know, coming from like places like Afghanistan and uh, usually, I mean, we all have this unconscious bias towards people. You always look at somebody and you judge them, which I think it's a human thing. Maybe we shouldn't do it or maybe we should think positively of it. But I think uh, coming to the UK as, a, as an Afghan, as a refugee, I mean, getting here, going through a very difficult journey and experiences and then being told, you know, you are lying, um, you are... Uh, you're, you're seen as a suspect, you're seen as a, as a criminal, and then somehow you are guilty and you have to prove yourself innocent. So the system is made in such a way to dehumanize you, to make you feel unwanted, unwelcome. And, and the issue we are discussing here about our allies, and I think it's, imp it's really important we need to have an ally, especially in the world that we're living in, a, the, the, the power dynamics, the idea of the power and privileges. I think I, I'm part of like many different committees and things, and when I'm a, part of a Quaker group in... Um, looking into century everywhere, and there's like some amazing old people, and they have you know, beautiful um, ideas and the reasons of why they do what they do, but then when I'm in the room, I could feel the sense of entitlement, the sense of, you know, we discuss power and privilege, but then still there is this, this feeling. So I feel like amongst friends, I think we should be critical. I think it's great there we have friends, but sometimes the friends are not well informed. The friends, sometimes people, um, they have their own idea of what it means to, to help and support refugees and how they perceive us as a kind of victims or people in, in, in need of help and support. And I think sometimes they have their own motives, but ultimately it's wonderful. There are people actually wanting to support us. But I think 
it's important to have people like ourselves at the, at the decision-making table, have us as a part of the discussion. Don't talk about us, talk to us, because I've been to so many conferences and events where people say great things, not, not to us, but behind us. They're, they're saying them about us right now in the cafe. Yes, so... <laughs> well, that, I mean, people maybe not, maybe they don't know that this discussion is happening here, but everyone is just like tired and busy. But yeah, I think uh, we need to be critical to, to our friends because they want to help and support us and we are grateful. But at the same time, um, I think things need to change in, in a way that needs to be inclusive. We need to be involved, we need to be engaged, and we not need to be seeing us just needing help. We can actually contribute to the discussion and the debate. Absolutely. Well, let me bring Sari in here because you used a very good word, which is um, something that was going to come up, which is entitlement. Now, this is supposed to be, this is not a campaigning panel. This is a critical panel. And I wanted to say, really, um, when you turn the lens upon the humanitarian sector, the third sector, the human rights sector, all the rest of it, what is it that's, that sticks in your craw a little bit? Well, I've got to say, firstly, I, I was sort of, my first experience with an amazing was with an amazing organisation called Migrant Voice, who are here today, uh, who are led by an amazing Lebanese woman called Nazek Ramadan, and that was my first experience. Wow. Uh, um, well, I, I think they're running their own group right now, um, but that sort of sheltered me and protected me um, because I. I actually think I avoided, I wanted to do my own thing, I avoided humanitarian organisations because I think unconsciously I knew that most of them were headed up by white people who didn't have, who didn't understand and were doing it out of a sense of, felt like they were doing it out of a sense of, sure they're helping people which is wonderful but there's a patronisation that comes with that. And if you do, don't fit into this stereotype of being somebody that needs to be saved or um, you, you're not put down in that way, I think you, you become sort of very difficult to deal with for people like that. So I've avoided it most of my life because I don't like hearing um, you know, ignorant or biased or offensive things, even if someone is doing a wonderful thing, there are some things that for me personally are inexcusable and I don't want to be around. Um, so yeah, those are the things, um, I mean, we could get into specifics, but, you know. <laughs> is, it, is it a question of tone? I think I'm trying to drill down to what is it that, that robs us up the tone, wrong way? Um, willful ignorance, which is, I think, what is going on here, wanting to live in this world where we, we want to help people, but we don't actually want to hear what they have to say. Um, and I think, in a positive sense, what I can say, what's really would be a good move for any of these organisations is to make sure the voices of people who have actually had experiences as refugees um, who are or who are currently going through that, but some of the people that are currently going through that are in too much pain. But people who have have been through that, to their voices, to be included in the administration, firstly in the administrative hierarchy, it can't just be white people, you know, because there's something wrong. If there if it is, then there's something wrong. So try to include them in your administrative hierarchy there needs to be a genuine voice, then listen to them and also allow those voices that have truly had those experiences to come through. And then you're on your way, you're in the step in the right direction to becoming a lot more genuine, you know, genuine and not patronising. I, I don't, I'm sorry, I'm not articulating myself. No, you are, well. but in a sense, it's like the, the people who are not guilty of that are the ones who stuck around to hear educating your allies. I just want to bring exactly. Bumi into this because uh, we're talking about a very subtle issue of tone and assumption. We're not talking about overt aggressions, are we? I mean, I really, I liked what you, the example you gave of being at art school and continually pointed towards these sort of testimonial style artworks as if we can't create art, we can only testify to our own pain and suffering in some sort of atavistic bringing forth of, <laughs> of I mean, experience. It's all really interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm, internally kind of channeling what you said about 
um, and showing that this is a critical conversation and looking at the, in, the nuances and sort of the micro reflections that actually inform our behaviors, assumptions that we perceive others um, based on the information that we're given uh, through the curriculum, through the media. Um, and this is why it's very, very important for people like us, in fact, everyone really, to be part of your own self-representation, telling your own stories across the board in the academic realm, in the cultural realm, um, organizations that are set up to truly propagate diversity, not just being like a catchphrase, but an actual practice, a culture. And even within groups that are you know, self-generated, um, collaboration is, the power dynamics, there's a balance there. So whether it's a small community group or a large institutional organization is about the culture of the intention. How are we setting these intentions? Power uh, relationships. Power very relationships, very absolutely. Yeah. But then even taking it away from race and gender and sort of the tri you know, some of the tri tribalistic spectrum, just as people, how do we engage with each other when you have egos and prides, and vulnerability? Am I good enough? Am I being seen in the right way? Um, people wanting to maybe sometimes overcompensate because the history is loaded. The history makes, it's the uncomfortable truth. I mean, the Commonwealth or the European Union or even the United Kingdom was forged on a legacy of all kinds of like the true aggression of humanity and our ability to wage wars and plunder for the sake of be it entitlement or a vision or an obsession. It's really, really complex, but if we're saying, I mean, today is the last day of Britain being in the EU, right? And it's like, it's really painful for a lot of people, and I get that, but also these boundaries and borders, be them ge ge geographic or psychological, are established with the consent of the individual, and we inform the collective. And even though Britain is no longer in the EU, we still inhabit the same space. We have people who are married to Germans and French and speak Spanish and we're all interconnected and it's about what we want moving forward because at present our government is not reflecting our ideals and it's impacting the people, the body of the people negatively. And the only way to truly heal and move collectively, progressively in a holistic di direction is to listen to each other and to work together and put our egos aside, clarify and set our intention and try our best to move forward positively with a sense of purpose and in a, in, in a spirit of togetherness. Um, Gulwali, Bumi used a really great uh, reference which was towards media narratives and representation. I was wondering if part of the problem that we have around being patronized and uh, subtleties of tone is that even the represent, uh, even seemingly progressive representations are patronizing them in uh, patronizing in themselves. So we spoke a lot about images of um, people dying in boats. They're represented as tragedies, but they're never individualized or humanized. Uh, and people are represented as being abject and in having lost everything, and then they somehow have earned the right to be helped because they've lost everything. So how do media representations play into the kinds of problematic depictions we see even in a humanitarian sphere? I think that's a, <clears throat> such an important point. So when we saw the image of, for example, Alan Kurdi, you know, his body was washed up uh, in Turkey, and people were, people conscious wake up, and there were like 100,000 people on the street of London, and uh, you know, people were wanting the government to do more, and, and I think media usually plays a, a very constructive, uh, I, I would say, destruct, destructive role. And they are so. Whenever I go, I have done over 100 interviews in the last four or five years, and whenever I go, they just want to tick this box that they had a refugee on, and they have their own agenda in thinking of what they want to get across. And, and sometimes I say things they don't expect that I would say because they just have a certain perceptions of what it means to be a refugee. And uh, it, it's tough in, in the current environment, in the hostile environment, to get the message across. And I mean, to be honest, I'm grateful to refugee organizations who are in the UK. I know most of the leaderships of those leading organizations. And I think there's, again, nothing wrong having a white male leading those organizations, but making it more inclusive, making it welcoming. Um, uh, Morris is there. He's the chief executive of the refugee council. He's, he's great, and he's been a very support, a big supporter and, and an ally. We need more people in positions of authority and power and influence to help us to, to help us to, to get our way. I mean, we, sometimes we say, you know, I, like, give people voice. No, we have a voice. We just need to be given the platform and, and, and the ability to kind of share our stories and experiences the way we want to share it, not the way the media here is. I mean, recently there was very interesting when the 39 uh, people were killed in the back of a refrigerator lorry. 
tragic incident and I had the Daily Express got in touch or the Sunday Express. Uh, a very nice journalist interviewed me and, uh, and there was an article saying the son of the doctor. Uh, the article started with the son of the doctor. So I was kind of pleased about that because that was the first time I saw that they were kind of like saying, oh, I'm a son of the doctor, that's, I'm a son of the doctor. But then I realized, and I was speaking to some people, because they were trying to portray an image or uh, assumptions that I was worthy of help because I was a son of a doctor. Like, it was a really interesting narrative, the way they were trying to portray my story and my experiences. So I think the media, there's, there's very few helpful media, but I think we need refugee organization, refugee sectors and charities to work together to come up with messages. So recently we have uh, IMAX, the Migration Communication Network. They've been doing work in together to bring about, to have a collective strong messages. We are very bad and we, we kind of doing our own things. We don't collaborate, we don't cooperate. And I think even though I'm kind of appreciative of the work that refugees does, for example, when The Lightless Sky was published, I got very little support from refugee organization in terms of kind of putting my story out there, trying to encourage people to read it. Like there were very few blogs and interviews that I had with, within the refugee sector. I got a lot more support from non-refugee sector yeah. than I did from refugee organizations. So I found it very up. strange uh, in that sense. But ultimately, I mean, it's up to people's intentions. And I think people usually have very good intention when they go into this work in this humanitarian field. I want to, I want to pick you up on, on what you just said, actually, because my next question was going to be, and I'll come to you, sir, on that. Is, it, is educating allies actually about getting beyond this world of humanitarian charities and, and, refu and refugee and initiatives which are small and which are grassroots, even though everyone is very kind and helpful and lots of people smile at you when you walk in because for some reason, I don't know why. Um, and yet, look at the optics. The previous session had only white, white, all white speakers apart from one and the room was full. And here we are now, and the room is nearly empty apart from the 20 brave souls who were willing to be educated. And yet your session on art oh, yeah, was, that full. was full. That was absolutely full. Why do you think that is? Is that, is that a sort of a, a getting around a psychological block, getting around an unwillingness to self-question? Is it something about art and culture? Yes. There is an there is a incredible thing about the arts, and that's... It has the power to move people. It has the way, power to change the way people feel. And that is the key, one of the keys to changing the world. But I feel that the reason that um, people are more um, open to uh, a session about art is because, rather than a discussion, is because it reaches places um, where discussion, people will feel very confronted. They'll feel confronted, they'll feel labeled. It's a very, this is a very hard discussion to have. When you do things through art, what it does is it gives the um, responsibility back to the viewer. And it's up to them to interpret what they're seeing and make up their own mind. And it also gives them the space to do that without being confronted. Um, so, both these things are important. Discussions about difficult things that are more confrontational are very important, but things that are more non-verbal, you know, non-verbal communication that we find in art, in the, all of the arts, music, reaches us in a place that makes us reflect without having the confrontation and we can make our own decisions based on our own reflection. That is if we have the ability to reflect and we are not the type of person who is both unconsciously biased and willfully ignorant. You've mentioned that phrase a couple of times, willful ignorance. What do you mean by that? It, I, what I mean by that is when um, a person sort of doesn't want to accept, doesn't want to reflect because it's too painful to reflect and it also will threaten their entire image of who they are and what they stand for. And um, a lot of people who are scripted in the saviour mentality when it comes to, the, comes to refugees, unfortunately, the, the, the best of them are people who are willing to be challenged. The best of all of us, that's not, that's not directed at anyone um, specifically, but people who are willing to be challenged and allow themselves to be challenged can go a lot further within in their own journey as human beings, in their spiritual journey, but also um, in helping other people. But those who are willfully ignorant are people who won't 
uh, who just won't bother to learn what the difference between Arabic and Farsi is, who won't bother to, you know, learn about what's really going on, but still want to be credited for helping refugees. Like who won't bother to show up to a panel called Educating Your Allies. Yeah, exactly. The, 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 the gap. We should have called it something else, like, I don't know, I think sharing it's a our very, pain. It's a very kind, it's a very kind title because uh, a question for the audience would be, should we, should it be our responsibility to educate? This, this is what I'm going to throw to for me right now. So we're doing this and we do this as, as part of our practice, not just as activists, but also as artists. It's just nice to be in a space and share ideas. Where does the responsibility really lie, though? Should we have to be political figures as well as being creative artists? I mean, you're a musician. Yeah. And an artist, yeah, you didn't... You. I think it's more about integration and separation because we operate on multiple spheres and dimensions. And for me, yes, the, the stage is, my, is the space where I'm able to clearly express my ideas and my views, be them spiritual, political, social, emotional, whatever it is, that is my medium. And that is how I have the most impact. And it can also be educational. It's not one or the other, it's a combination of things. And um, I think as far as education is concerned, even in just sort of general education, how do you make it engaging? And like Sarah mentioned about the confrontation, sometimes people don't want to be confronted. We're dealing already with so much in your lives, you know, you're literally in a pressure chamber. And, and we have the right not to want to be confronted, but I think that all changes when you're right. actually I working. I want to hear from Bumi, I want to hear from Bumi. I think refugees. irrespective, I think when, even when you are working with refugees, you've come mm -hmm. to, into that dynamic with preconceived ideas. A lot of people have come there to learn or they think, you know what, the government's not doing anything, I can do this. If mm -hmm. I can do one thing that impacts one life, that is something, I've done something, and they have the right to do that. But then you cannot control the way people will respond to a calling. If someone's going to go all out and say, well, actually, I'm going to remove myself and dissolve, dissolve my ego and my sense of being and actually just look at this for what it is and really have an understanding and knowing that that understanding will not be absolute in the moment, but it's a growing thing and it's evolving and I'm evolving through it and it's not instant. And you're saying, okay, fine, in terms of the way the brain works, in terms of creating new, new sort of pathways and neurons that create a cluster that withholds a certain sensation or understanding. There has to be repetition. So it's really, what is the culture of support? What does it look like, not just in theory, but in practice? How is it effective? And it's not just, again, when you're looking at that binary, the savior, victim dynamic, it transcends that. And we also are pulling ourselves up. And you also have people having, well, actually, you know, why can't you help yourself? Why are you so vulnerable? Why do you need my support? Again, the feeling of un uncomfortability, it's like feeling inadequate about something, but if there are external issues that are learned, sort of interweaving to create targeted discord in a space, and you have not just like social or cultural, psychological, but economic systems that are forensically engineered to cause regression, you can't say oh, it's a conspiracy, I'm just, no, all of these things are happening and it's so, so delicate. So to bring it all back, yes, we do have to be political because politics and music and culture are all intertwined. You look at people like, I don't know, Harry Bolafonte or Bob Marley or, you know, even MIA, who have used their platform and used their craft to truly create impact in ways that no conversation can reach. Because like you said, it's an emotional, it's a personal experience. And you can share that with your children. You can learn it without even knowing you're learning it. And it informs the fabric of who you are as a human being. Yeah. Galway, I want to bring you in here because in a sense you have quite clearly stepped forward as someone who speaks about and confronts issues around um, particularly asylum and refuge. In fact, one of the first times I met you, we were talking specifically about that issue. We were talking about the Home Office. Why did you decide to take on board that role? It would be completely forgivable if you said, look, this is my experience. It was really difficult. I want to get on with my life. I don't want to have to talk about all these things for an audience that's going to eat it all up about how awful it was. Uh, but you put yourself in that space. So my question is really why? 
That's a, that's a very good question, <clears throat> because there are a lot of friends I have refugees and asylum seekers who just doesn't want people to know they're refugees or asylum seekers. They don't like the labeling. They don't want to be associated. They know the negative impact it could have. Um, and so they just keep themselves to themselves. And I had that thought, I just want to get on with my life and I just want to do what I need to do. But then I realized there was a sense of responsibility I had. People saw refugees. Refugees are just this one word, this legal definition of legal terms. People, refugees are very diverse. They're from different backgrounds. They're individuals, and that's what we're missing. And I felt like the media and, and charities and politicians, everyone was talking about us without our participations. And I thought, okay. like, even this, this, this wonderful summit, uh, I only met eight young refugees because they came through the, with Corin, the uh, refugee charity, the children charity, they had a young citizen program. Um, it's about refugees, but there are very few refugees here. And in fact, I have invited myself to be here. I'm sure they would have invited me, but I, before they invited me, I said I was willing to come uh, and contribute. So I think there's always, I have this sense of this responsibility and duty to actually, by sharing my experiences to make things better, it's not something I feel comfortable with. It's not something that I enjoy doing. I was mentioning in my early session in the, the work of art, but I feel it's great. I have a sense of, it's also a privilege I've been able to travel, I've been able to, uh, people take me seriously because I'm an author and I'm a writer and it's uh, things, I'm like, even though I'm a refugee, but I'm not just any like the typical, I don't know, the normal refugee that people see. Um, I'm somewhat in a unique position to actually influence things. And I would say the two things that really troubles me is um, I met a lot of pe really good people who work with refugees, who work with refugee charities, but who have very little knowledge and understanding. I wouldn't say ignorance, I think understanding and knowledge of what they're doing. They have very little training of how to deal with refugees. They all, it's, I have met people who actually assume in the same way that Home Office does about refugees, they're like, oh, they're like, they're whatever. They assume certain image about these people, even though their intention is good to help, but ultimately they don't have the necessary training and experiences to understand those refugees are individuals and, and the dynamics, I mean like Afghans, there are so many different ethnic groups and there's so many different languages and so many different kind of culture needs and so on. So I would say we need more refugee participations, not only in decision making, but also just generally in conferences like this. Uh, we need to make an effort to bring them on board, to support them, to help them, to give them some sort of, I don't know, incentives or uh, ideas to be here because I think conversation about us without us doesn't make sense. Uh, and so it's great that we have this conversation. I think I'm not ne being negative about not having enough people here. I think people are just being busy out and about. There's so much great You're things so forgiving. happening. I'm not forgiving at all. Um, I'm a punisher. I'm a little disappointed, but I think it's... I, <laughs> I don't like think to punish. I'm very punitive. I don't think it's purposely Thank done. Thank you to everyone who's no, here. Yes, I like yes, to exactly. really appreciate yeah. all of I you mean, guys that are here. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, very, it's, it's, it's incredibly telling. Freud said people are very obvious in what they do. And uh, I'm not a Freudian, but it's really true that all you have to do is look at the room sure, and see sure. what the power dynamics are. Anyway, carry on. So, no, I, 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 well, I, still, I see it a little differently, but I mean, like, ultimately, I do what I do because I care about the subject matter. I'm passionate about it. I want to make things better. Uh, it's not easy, but I think stories are powerful. By sharing my story, um, things happen. People listen. I mean, I get letters from across the world. People write to me from all over, and people get influenced and impacted by the story in my journey and experiences. They go out and volunteer. They become befriending. They become mentors. They become, actually, people wrote to me, they become foster carers as a result of reading my story. Mm -hmm. So a lot of good comes out of it. I was speaking to Jazz this morning. Uh, I met her mother a few months ago, and she said she's she fostering three young people from uh, Sudan, Eritrea, and Afghanistan. She said, my book literally help her to understand their backgrounds and their experiences because a lot of the time young people are not not interested or wanting to share their stories. I mean, we are, as refugees, we are more interested to talk about our aspirations. In the media, or even working with a refugee organization, they want you to tell your stories in, in, in a way to, see, to, be, to make you, to make, get people to feel sorry for you. I mean, empathy and sympathies are important, but I think I, I want us to talk about our aspirations, just, our challenges and obstacles and barriers rather than talking about our past. I just want to bring in here. Um, because you said something that I, I have to say it before I forget it, which is this conversation is not new. So we've been having this conversation for a few years now. Hostile environment was a 2013 invention of Theresa May. Uh, it didn't start in 2016 at all. Do you think, speaking on this day that we are indeed speaking, that we have gone backwards in terms of the debate and the discourse? Or is it that it was always there and the toxic matter is finally coming out so that we can actually have, even with 10 people in the audience, we can actually have a difficult discussion. How are you interpreting this moment that we're having this conversation? I'm not enough of an expert to answer that question, but I will say that I definitely, and it's undeniable that I, there has been a rise in 
you know, racist, Islamophobic, anti-Semitic um, attacks on people, f for starters. Um, there's been a lot of language and ignorant sort of phrasing and terms that have suddenly become okay now, that for a, quite a few years, sort of most people knew it wasn't okay uh, to say certain things. And I've definitely, I've definitely felt very heavy. I've definitely felt like we're moving backwards. I've definitely been despairing since, you know, all of my life's work has been about trying to challenge um, perspectives, negative perspectives and stereotypes um, around people who are marginalized or misrepresented or mal maligned in the media. And you do despair a lot. And I, I, I can't deny that I've felt much worse recently. But it's always been there. Yes, it has. <coughs> we'll come, uh, the last question will be about ways forward. So I'm not going to end on a down note. But Bumi, I want to bring you in here because my question really, when I was reading about your cases, I see you as a creative artist. And I read about your case, which is in the, you know, covered by the BBC, as if you're suddenly a sort of political figure. And my question to you is, did you have to go through your own radicalization process when you mm -hmm. were confronted by this sudden sort of back chat from, from the Home Office? These questions about, oh, you are this, but you're not that. You're this, but you're not this other thing. Long story, long story. Yeah, no, it's it's <laughs> interesting. Story I'm, I'm processing what everyone's saying. And um, <clears throat> again, looking at the hist historical context, I think about people like, um, you know, even Gandhi or like Marcus Garvey or even Mandela, who the sort of these flux, these sort of these waves, and the moments of real intensity where it's breaking point and the inflammation is sort of that abscess comes out and people are forced to take a stance. And it happens in periods maybe every 20 or 30 years or in different, it's ongoing, it's ongoing. And where, whereas there has, there has been progress, there's also been regression. And it's also understanding that people who are at one stage in their lives progressive doesn't mean that they are progressive for the entire duration. People regress. People who fought for the civil rights movement and other movements and like at the end of their lives or in their 70s now going, but what was all that about? What's really, okay, the things that have changed in terms of more color and more visibility, people having a better understanding of their rights, sort of that being, um, a, what's the word I'm looking for, applied institutionally and globally in different ways in different spaces, but it's an ongoing narrative. It's not over. You know, um, as the, the baton of power moves from one civilization to another, they come with their own rules and their own <laughs> sort of, uh, sort of prefabrications and conditions and we all have to kind of find our way in this unpredictable volatile space and it's just like you have to hold your own space what is the vision i have for the world i inhabit i'm not going to appropriate the inflammation of the external because i'm supposed to be provoked by this you do not control me you don't hold space in my mind mm -hmm. but those who are like-minded what are we doing and how are we doing it and how can we be effective in our practice this is the core of it all, and with me, it's just like, literally, yeah, it's like, oh my goodness, I think I'm having an out-of-body experience. Okay, they're talking about me, but is that who I am, a jazz singer who faced deportation? Is that it? Mm -hmm. And it's just like, even in that narrative, that wasn't the original title that was submitted, but that was more scintillating, I suppose, but it's a real person, it's a real life, who's being displaced, who they're trying to uproot, who is, sort of the consequence, well, <laughs> well, the thing about being like a, um, I'm a representative of a generation that a massive injustice has been imposed upon. And yes, things have changed in the 70s when my parents were here, you know, I mean, this was sort of somewhere in between the Commonwealth and before right of abode was necessary and the relationship that Britain has with Spain as of today, not tomorrow, was the same that Nigeria had with the UK where you just jump on a flight and you come here and it was fine. And it was the colony, the master, you know, the mother colony or the mother country and everyone had a sense of allegiance and were patriotic and was part of their education and their aspirations. So as the narrative changes, what are the consequences? Who are the casualties of rebranding? And when a corporate model has been applied to a human, like a human experience, what role does humanitarianism have in the corporate world? For example, I'm going to take what you say, and then we'll go for last words. So, Gulwali, stepping forward, this panel was called "Educating Our Allies." We're going to open up to questions 
after last words, how would you like to see things change moving forward so that we're not here at another summit in three years' time when England is basically like the Hunger Games or something like that, <laughs> fighting each other for resources? How do you think you would like to see things evolve? I mean, we're living in a very uh, difficult time, especially with Brexit and what's happening, you know, in terms of racism and, exp exp like, you know, discriminations against foreigners and, and I mean the EU citizens are angry the way the Home Office treats them. I'm like, mm -hmm. you haven't seen what it means to be an asylum seeker. I mean, it's terrible what's happening to them, but it's nothing to what happens to us. I mean, you know, um, so I worry and I'm concerned about the future, but I think we need to stick together and I think our allies and friends need to really um, maybe re-examine uh, their intentions, the reasons what they do and how we can, because a lot of charities, a lot of organizations uh, kind of compete over resources rather than collaborating and, mm -hmm. and, and working together and, and, and for a bigger cause. I just remember a beautiful quote from a Power Privilege booklet, which was something like, if you're here to help me, then you're in the wrong place. But because if you're here to help me, then you're in the wrong place. But if you're here because your freedom is born to my struggle, then we can work together, something, something along those lines. So we have to um, really rethink uh, and reflect. And I think, uh, you know, I'm sure uh, a few years down the line we might be having a similar conversation. Then that means we haven't moved forward. I just definitely want more young, young people. I want more refugees in asylum seekers. I actually don't want to use those terms. I want the people from, you know, um, who are new to the country, who I want them to be involved and in, in participate and uh, in contribute and share their ideas. They're very creative. I mean, like I don't have every solution, but I mean, if we had a, a panel of young refugees or people, by, experts by experience had here, they would have perhaps give us better ideas of how to educate our allies. They will tell us what they need and how they appreciate, to do, appreciate people that would have done things differently. Uh, in their cases. So I think we need to hear from people who have experiences and don't just see them as an expert by, by open experience, expert by experience, but actually see them as a, as a fellow human beings, as people who can actually, you know, uh, contribute more than just to talk about their experiences. Because I, I can talk about policies, I can talk about politics, I can talk about laws other than just my experiences, you know? I, and I can talk about my education. and. Exactly, no, I we, don't want to be put into a box. And we don't want to be used as these figures that basically cut open a vein exactly. and offer up our suffering for other people to put in their pie and feel that they had a really worthy meal. Uh, Sarah, um, moving forward, how moving can we evolve forward, the conversation? I think what I'd like to see is people being treated with dignity and as the complex beings that we all are. Um, which kind of echoes what you were saying. No pigeonholing, relate to the person in front of you as a human being, not somebody that you're supposed to be saving that's gonna make you look great. Um, have more voices that have that experience in the, you know, right up at the top with these organizations. I'm not talking about other organizations, I'm talking about NGOs and, and um, organizations that relate to refugees. Um, and also, just on your point of being a political artist, I wanted to say that it's not our choice. When you come from somewhere like Iran or Afghanistan, even if you don't want to be involved in politics, which I don't, I'm forced into it and everybody reads it that way. And what and my dream, I suppose one of them, would be that somebody else who's from where I'm from in the future will be seen as a human being. They won't just be judged based on where they're from or have these ridiculous, you know, preconceived stereotypes based on the type of work they make, you know? Me doing a series about women who wear the hijab doesn't mean that I'm a Muslim you know, who wears a hijab, quite the opposite. What it means is that I am an artist who is reflecting upon my environment and making a comment, which is what artists are meant to do. And I want to exist in a world where people can see beyond what they see on the surface. For me, last words. Uh, I have to say right up front, you said uh, that you were more than a headline of jazz singer faces deportation, but can I just say, that would make the most amazing film ever. <laughs> I mean, it probably would, and um, it's all pretty. It's all pretty spectacular. I think that, in on reflection, educating our allies is the right title for this conversation, because it 
alludes to the power of education. The reason why the four of us are stood here or sat here having this conversation is because we can articulate our point of view in different ways. And by so doing, we break and shatter stereotypes and encourage other people actually to do the same at whatever level. Um, you set an example and then the young Iranian girl goes, she's like me, I can do that, I can be that. And so in some ways, maybe not being so um, hard on the system because we are a part of the change that we want to see. We must be those examples. And we most, uh, we're at different um, intersections of society. And those of us who are in the creative or cultural or educational or in the economic realm, whatever sector you are, ensure that you are able to impact that space so that the access that you desire, you generate. Because we have to generate it. If we're saying, oh yeah, you should, you should, no, 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 it's not there. It's like, it's a 360, it's everyone. It's a 360 yeah. effort. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, which is um, educating our allies and thinking about the allies that I've had, one of which is Lord Roger Roberts, who's a Lib, Lib Dem um, Lord, who is very, very active, who was so active in Calais. This man has a sense of purpose in life and understands the language of power and how to utilize it to make change. He could just be chilled out, retired, somewhere in Wales, listening to great music, reflecting on his life, but it's like actually, these last years I've got, I've got to do as much work as possible. Um, he's a patron of the Citizens of the World Choir, which is why I'm here. That's Sarah and I met before, but met where we connected through the choir, Rachel, a few members Sue, here. Tess. We are all part of that and we do understand the power that art and music has to permeate and make the uncomfortable accessible through inclusion. That's a very good last phrase though, making the... <laughs> but it's a great prompt to the audience. That's why I want to end there and open up to the audience. Uh, right at the front. Okay, speak up loud. The Just speak into it like this. <laughs> oh, no, it's too late, it's been drunk. Um, yeah, it's just a comment, really, just to say thank you very much, but also um, what I've heard, I think, is that it's about everyone being an us, because you can, even with organisations that are trying to help, you can still get them an us. And, mm. and, and it takes a lot of grace and a lot of... Uh, learning on on all sides in order to realize that all we actually have is us that you know we need to leave behind need to leave behind the past and just be us as individuals and loving each other and singing together <laughs> thank you who else can pass it on to people don't be afraid yeah don't fear the mic sorry if you were a bit mean in you know <laughs> They don't want the mic. <laughs> Caroline, go for it. Yes. Um, so we go. So, um, I work for an organization called Latin American Women's Aid. And we work for uh, Latin American women in living through gender based violence. And we run a empowerment program for these this women. And once, a uh, uh, white South African came to the workshop. Um, <laughs> Is that really the answer as well, that really, we're talking about educating our allies as if it's, this is some big task, but actually what we're really asking for is self-awareness, 
self-reflection, things which aren't really, I mean, they're different. They're we like, should all be reflecting. Yeah. We it should all be self-reflecting, you know? It's an interesting one because this is, again, uh, the inclusion is a two-way streak. And which you're talking about Latin, your, your work with Latin women who have escaped gender-based violence. That is already such a traumatic space. And so you have women who need space to heal and to release the trauma and to rebuild themselves. And then you have this woman who has this act of empathy. And she's like, don't shut me out. Don't shut me out. No, I really like, honestly, you don't understand. I feel it in ways that you cannot understand. And even though it may come across as entitled or privileged, in my mind, my name is Maria. <laughs> okay? But it's like, how do, you, Portuguese food. how do you set the boundaries? And how do you do it in a way and, and be firm enough to say, listen, this is not the time. Maybe creating a different version of that, saying, well, women who are at a point where they want to share and they want to connect and they're ready for that integration and inclusion, you come to that. But also for her not experiencing like a shame or guilt or insensitivity because she's probably come with the best intentions. And yes, she's writing the email going, ah! but what is that? What is she really saying? And it's almost like, yes, there is a guilt because we've done a lot of horrible things to each other. And a, lo a lot of them are very much race-led and race-driven. And as someone who has inherited, again, a legacy of negativity or cruelty, and you just want to kind of atone, even if that could be a strong that's word. That's true. It's a lottery where you're born in the world, and how that works you, both ways. How do, you, how do you do that? My favorite example is, and these are all from people who don't work there anymore, one of these diversity and inclusion summit meetings, it was at Channel 4, and on one side of the table, it was all the people of color who work in the media. And at the other side, it was the executives oh who gosh. weren't. And uh, we were trying and trying to have a dialogue. And at the end, one of them came up to me and said, you know, the thing is, what's so difficult for us is that we have so much colonial guilt. <laughs> and that was one of my all time. I, I know. And I was like, God, poor you. And in the end, they gave 100% of none of us any opportunities. And I'm only saying that because nobody in this anecdote still works there. But I thought it was very funny. But the kind of the, the disconnect between what they appear to be performing and what is actually going on psychologically would take so many centuries to explain sure. that I thought, you know what, you can have it. And they ticked the box saying that they had their diversity talk. And I never heard from any of them again. And that was 20 years ago. Anyway, anyone got a comment? No, I think we're coming to the end of this session because we don't want to take up uh, the time for the next one. So thank you for sticking with us. I hope all the people who felt they didn't need to be educated had a really nice coffee in the cafe. Um, <laughs> if they could get our names right, that would be really amazing. Uh, but I think that for those people who are in this room, we shared, we got really honest. We were nuanced. This is not a campaigning panel. This was a delicate, reflective panel. So thank you very, very, very much. Gowali, Bumi, and Sara, you were thank absolutely you. brilliant. You. And thanks to you for coming.